Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary is in far western New South Wales in the Mallee, and it's part of Barkindji country. If you look west from the tallest sand ridge, you can watch the sun go down over the dunes in South Australia. The sand is orange and the vegetation is a mix of old bilar she-oak trees, spinifex, and a sea of Mallee eucalypt woodland. AWC purchased Scotia from Earth Sanctuaries in 2002, taking on stewardship of a trailblazing project, one of the first large-scale feral predator-free fenced areas in Australia, and a safe haven for several of Australia's rarest mammal species. My guest today is wildlife ecologist, Dr. Rachel Ladd, who leads the on-ground science program at Scotia and also at our nearby Mallee Cliffs Project, a partnership with New South Wales National Parks. Rachel's extensive career includes looking into how honey eaters respond to revegetation projects and a PhD focused on detecting populations of a rare species of deer in Cambodia. Rachel is joining us today from our operations base next to the Murray River near Mildura. Thanks for joining me today, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about Scotia. Can you set the scene for people who haven't been there? How do you get there from where your operations base is? Um, yeah, so we basically kind of head uh, northwest a little bit, um, heading out towards Broken Hill. Um, Scotia is kind of about halfway between Mildura and Broken Hill. Um, and yeah, we follow the um, Silver City Highway up and then kind of, yeah, take a left out west um, to get to the property where it kind of sits on the South Australian border. The Riverina where you are is the, the food bowl of Australia. It's a big farming area. And I know there's lots of different sorts of farming around there. How does the landscape change as you head north and west uh, heading into Scotia? Yeah, so um, leaving Mildura, you see uh, some irrigated crops and um, vineyards, um, that sort of thing. And then, yeah, as you kind of continue out past Wentworth, um, heading north, um, that kind of changes to more cleared grazing land, um, a lot of kind of open paddocks and sheep grazing out that way. Um, and then, yeah, that kind of continues on for quite a while um, until we kind of turn off the bitumen and onto the dirt and, um, yeah, driving kind of past a couple of pastoral properties and then we start heading into um, some properties managed for conservation. So we uh, travel through neighbouring Nanya Station, which is managed for conservation, which is where we kind of start seeing all of our beautiful Mallee woodland kind of come up the uncleared sort of areas. And then, um, yeah, basically the first side of Scotia you get is of our feral predator fruit fence, um, which we kind of travel along and then head into sanctuary. Yeah, the, the fence, such an important piece of conservation infrastructure. And I know some of the people watching will have visited the site. AWC has a long history of Scotia, which I, I touched on in the introduction. A lot of really important science has happened there over the past two decades. It's where we laid the foundations of our national program of wildlife translocations, as well as a lot of research surrounding those reintroductions. Um, yeah, we've looked at how numbats use different habitat types, how many animals you need for a successful reintroduction, and also looking at those ecosystem engineers, bilbies and betongs uh, that burrow and dig and enrich and aerate the soil as they do so. So it's this very important site in AWC's story. What are the reintroduced species currently at Scotia? So we currently have four reintroduced species. Uh, the numbat, the burrowing bass one, the greater bilby, and the bridled nail tail wallaby. And that last one is what we'll be talking mostly about today, the bridled nail tail wallaby. How have you seen the effects of drought and La Nina? You know, it's kind of alternated over the last few years between really severe, extreme drought, uh, and then, you know, oscillating back to La Nina, where we've had several wetter years in a row, um, and I think that's been the case in Western New South Wales as well. How does that sort of embody itself in the bush and, and at Scotia in populations of wildlife? Yeah, so um, a lot of the uh, wildlife that live in these kind of semi-arid arid areas, they go through these boom and bust cycles um, along with the rainfall. So in the drought conditions, their populations decrease, sometimes quite dramatically as food resources kind of um, start disappearing a bit. And then when we get the return of um, higher rainfall and um, that kind of vegetation and food resources come back, 
these populations are really good at taking advantage of that. Um, they can start increasing very quickly and we get a boom with uh, really high populations. Mm. And yeah, as you said, we've kind of seen that at Scotia, particularly um, most obviously quite recently with the really severe 2018-19 drought um, was the lowest rainfall recorded at Scotia um, previously and it was quite severe. Our populations of reintroduced um, mammals all decreased dramatically. Um, some of them even got as low as around 150, 100 individuals left, so quite severe. But then, um, yeah, in 2020, we had a return to kind of more normal rainfall levels and um, increased rainfall over the last kind of couple of years. 2022 was a particularly wet year. And these species have all rebounded um, really well. Their population sizes have increased dramatically. Um, some of them are sitting up around 1,000 individuals now. So that's, yeah, massive increase over just a few years. How interesting. And I guess, like you were saying, that boom and bust is a natural sort of fluctuation. That, that's what these animals are adapted to, those those really dramatic changes in conditions from year to year. But it's different, isn't it, when they're, when they're within an, a fenced area, a safe haven like Scotia. Sure, it's big, you know, 8,000 hectares between the two, two sections of the Scotia safe haven. But what does the that bust period mean for populations like if they're going through a period of very low numbers over several years what are the risks of that yeah so um one of the things is when you have reduced that population to such a low level um that population can go through a genetic bottleneck um where you've lost some of the genetic diversity that exists in that population and yeah the other risk particularly with these uh fenced area properties is that it's a limited like space that these animals can go into um they can't disperse out of that area and they also, there are no nearby sources um, of the same species nearby. So when you get paternal returns, you can't get any new animals coming in without assistance from people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there is a risk that um, in a very severe situation that the populations just continue to go down and crash completely and can't recover. So, so worst case scenario, you'd get bust with populations going locally extinct and yeah. obviously having invested such a lot of resources and energy and research into this project, we don't want to get to that point. So how has that sort of experience of the last five, 10 years of, of drought and La Nina changed how we think about populations? I, I think, you know, before we were sort of managing and assuming they'd do pretty well in a, a scale at that size, have we changed how we look at managing populations now? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so we've um, so NBC is putting in place population management plans for all of our species um, that include um, trigger points in there when population levels or environmental conditions get to certain points, and then that, that triggers us putting in place certain interventions. Um, so increasing the amount of supplementary water provided or even providing supplementary food um, and actions like that to just kind of sustain this population through those really harsh conditions. Um, and yeah, given um, like the situation with climate change and that those really harsh conditions where we do see kind of very intense drought periods and more frequent drought periods, it's becoming very important that we have the strategy in place to manage these populations through those times. So you mentioned that the four species, the four reintroduced species that are uh, extant at Scotia at the moment are numbats, bilbies, burrowing betongs, and bridled nail tail wallaby. And this is one of the species that goes through those population booms and busts. And, and a lot of macropods do that, especially in the arid zone. Um, very few people will have seen a bridled nail tail wallaby in person. Uh, so for someone who hasn't, can you describe what they're like? Yeah, sure. Um, so they're a small macropod. Um, females can get up to about six kilos and males up to eight, but often they're a bit smaller. Um, they have kind of a, a greyish soft fur and um, they also have this distinctive white uh, bridle around their shoulders. So starting from the back of the neck and coming down around behind their forearms. And um, the nail tail part of their name comes from the bony spur that's at the tip of their tail. I was going to ask about why the name nail tail. And from what I know, no one really knows that it has any function. It's just kind of the end of their tail that doesn't have fur and is a, a bit of a, you know, kind of like a fingernail almost. Is that right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a mystery exactly why it is. There's been a bit of speculation, I guess, on um, like potential um, habitats, like some of the locations where it used to occur were quite rocky and that, and whether it had kind of 
you know, some function there. But yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. And this is one of the species that was considered extinct for almost four decades from the 1930s through till 1973. And it's a terrific story that some people may have heard before. Um, there was a, an article in Woman's Day magazine in 1973 called Our Rare Ones, all about uh, threatened and extinct animals. And it, it had profiles of some of these species, um, you know, things like the Tasmanian tiger, pig-footed bandicoot, things like that were, were profiled in this article. Um, and also was included the bridled nail tail wallaby, which hadn't been seen at that point for decades. And there was a, a fencer, uh, Mr. Chalicombe in Western Queensland, who had been working on a property out there, repairing a fence, and flipped through this magazine on his smoko uh, and noticed these wallabies that he had been seeing around in the bush while he'd been working on this fence. Um, he reported the sighting to the, the authorities in Queensland and National Parks was alerted that actually, yeah, there were still these populations, small populations, but that they were hanging on in, in sort of southern uh, western Queensland. So it's this fantastic story where thanks to Woman's Day, the bridled nail tail wallaby was given a second chance at survival. So that, that's how it was rediscovered in the 70s, but there were still only small populations uh, in that, um, that original site. So what about AWC's history with the species and the population at Scotia? Yeah, so um, the bridled nail tail wallaby uh, first came to Scotia um, prior to AWC managing the property um, with Earth Sanctuaries. They established a, um, a kind of breeding population, had a very small number of founders um, with that. And then when AWC took over um, management of the property and they um, kind of upgraded to the fencing and removed all the feral predators and that, um, they released the wallaby out into the, the main uh, stages of Scotia. And yeah, we've been managing the species there ever since. And um, AWC has also started another reintroduced population of the nail tail at our um, New South Wales Parks partnership site at the Pilliga. Um, so they were reintroduced in 2019. So that's quite um, quite different habitat, I imagine. The Pilliga is, you know, very forested environment. Um, but we know that the historical range took in a, a larger diversity of habitat than where they're found today. Do we have an understanding of why they've declined so much from that that sort of strip inland of the Great Divide? Um, so uh, probably the primary causes would be um, feral cats and foxes with the uh, juveniles particularly vulnerable. Um, and they're also impacted by uh, wild dogs or dingoes um, as well where they occur together. Mm. And then uh, habitat loss and um, altered habitat use, particularly uh, sheep grazing has also had a pretty negative impact on them. Mm. Yeah, like so many of the species that are in that sort of western woodland and, and grassland habitat, um, just decimated. And yeah, you mentioned cats and foxes. And I think, you know, pe people might think it sounds like a big job for a, a cat to take down a wallaby. But these species are smaller than you think, aren't they? I, I think whenever mm -hmm. I've seen them, well, they're sort of up to your knee. Um, or yeah. A little bit taller than your knee. So quite a small wallaby in the scheme of things. Yeah, and particularly like the juveniles, um, when they're newly independent, they are quite small. Um, they can be, you know, just over a kilo um, to two kilos. Um, and yeah, cats are incredibly efficient hunters and are able to take on some relatively large prey compared to their own body size. Scary stuff. They're public enemy number one for wildlife, as, as our audience knows. So we've got this population at Scotia that's been booming and busting. Um, and... Like you said, following the drought, we uh, came up with population management plan for the species at Scotia. And part of that included not just managing that one population, but also the, the multiple sites where the species occurs. And one of the recommendations from the genetic analysis we did was to think of it as a meta population. Can you explain to us that concept? What, what's a meta population? What does that mean? Um, so yeah, the bridal nail tail wallaby is, exists it, or occurs in a couple of distinct populations that can't um, kind of um, disperse between each other because the distances are too great and that. And so, um, yeah, so each like individual distinct population, when you look at the global population of the species, um, the meta population consists of all those small isolated populations. So looking at those discrete um, areas where they can't travel as a whole, intervening to manage them as a whole, um, 
is climate an aspect of that approach to managing them? Um, to an extent, yeah. So I'm managing it as a metal population and kind of facilitating um, the movement of individuals between also facilitates gene flow and maintains the genetic diversity of these populations, um, which kind of preserves adaptive potential in the species and exposing them to these uh, kind of different habitats and climatic conditions within their range. Um, also kind of uh, exerts different kind of um, selection pressures on the populations and encourages diversity within the kind of entire meta population or the entire kind of global population of the species. Hmm. So that brings us to this past month where you've been involved in a, a supplementary translocation of bridled nail tail wallabies to Scotia. Can you talk us through what was the objective of this translocation uh, to start with? What, what were we trying to achieve? Yeah, so um, the primary objective was to improve the genetics of the Scotia population by um, bringing in some individuals from a quite diverse, like genetically diverse population and introducing them to the Scotia population, which um, due to having like a low found number of founders to start with and going through these kind of the drought periods where the population has dropped quite low, has a relatively low genetic diversity. And so we're trying to enhance that. To plan the translocation, where did you source the animals from and and how did they actually get to Scotia? What happened there? Yeah, so the animals came from uh, Taunton National Park up in Queensland, about two hours west of Rockhampton. Um, this is the last remnant, or well, the only remnant population of the species. All the other populations are reintroduced, and it's also the population with the greatest genetic diversity. So, um, you know, we worked with uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Services to uh, capture the individuals. We had a veterinary team from uh, Village Theme Village Theme Park Roadshow um, who did health checks on all the animals before uh, we selected them, and um, yeah, then we. I uh, put them into bags, into pet packs, and put them on a charter flight and flew them down to New South Wales and took them out um, on the sanctuary and released them. But yeah, it all went really smoothly. Um, the animals arrived alive and well. And yeah, when we let them go, they were quite calm coming out of the bag, taking a look around and taking in their new surrounds. Um, a couple of the males were quite keen to get some food in them, <laughs> immediately taking a nibble of the salt bush that was nearby. And yeah, they've been settling in well. We think we can track them with the radio collars we've put on them. And um, yeah, they're moving around to their new enclosure and finding nice shelter sites and yeah, hoping that they're making some new friends. You mentioned tracking the animals after the release. Um, what sort of technology are you using to find out how they're using the landscape? And, uh, and do the collars stay on for long? Yeah, so... Um, the cars have a VHF radio transmitter. Um, so we take that with some uh, VHF radio receivers, um, handheld um, Yagis or aerials, um, as well as we have a vehicle set up as well with aerials, as well as um, a tower system where we've got some radio tracking towers uh, placed on the back of trailers that we can move around that automatically log uh, the animals as they come in range. Um, so the system works. All colors are on the same frequency and they all have a unique ID number um, so we can track each individual and kind of see where they are yeah. through that system. And um, yeah, the colors, they'll, they can stay on for up to 12 months. Um, just kind of um, seeing how we do some regular tracking during that first 12 months to get our hands on them and have a closer health check and make sure they're doing this okay, as well as checking the condition of their colors so they may get removed earlier if needed, um, if they've become damaged or there's uh, any kind of fit issue and that sort of thing. You've been involved in translocations of a, a number of different species down at the two sites since you've been in the role. How did this one with wallabies compare? Um, so yeah, this one was probably one of the more logistically complex ones I've worked on um, with the distance involved and the size of the animals and making sure that we're doing uh, like a veterinary health assessment, which we don't always do with some of our other species. Um, and yeah, and then working with uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Services has been kind of great, um, putting their help with all of the tracking of the animals and um, yeah, the veterinary team as well. Um, yeah, it's been really good. Um, but yes, the big kind of logistical challenge to get organised and pulled, pulled together. Yeah, it, it's really impressive. I think all of these operations that we do to move species interstate around the country 
often involving charter flights and veterinary teams, um, all of the tracking that goes on afterwards. There's such a lot of work involved, but we know that for a species like this, the supplementation will give genetic health to that, that species and help future-proof it, hopefully, for um, you know, the changing conditions that it'll face over the next years and decades. Rachel, thanks so much for joining us today and talking through this most recent translocation of bridled nail tail wallabies to Scotia. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. If you've been inspired by this conversation and the work that AWC is doing, please consider making a donation. Give us a call, send an email, or go to australianwildlife.org to help us save Australia's threatened wildlife from extinction. And stay tuned for our next webinar next month.